Hello and welcome, Mike Rob Hunter here, Oliver, and welcome to another podcast episode where I answer some of the questions that I receive. The advantage of a podcast, of course, I can take my time. I'm not quite as pressed for time as I am when I make a YouTube video. Um, and uh, in this uh, episode, I want to answer the question why uh, microscopes um, are alone generally not enough when you want uh, to identify bacteria. Microscopes well, are quite important uh, in the field of uh, biology, of course, but um, yeah, sometimes uh, they might not play as um, an important of a role as one might expect. And in the case of um, identification of bacteria, it uh, might be surprising to some of you that uh, microscopes actually are not so important. I mean, they have their role in quality control um, and in checking whether your growth medium is contaminated or not. I'm going to talk about this later a little bit more. Uh, but uh, really, there are other methods if you want to identify bacteria. And I'm going to now uh, tell you in quite a bit of depth, I would say, um, why this is the case and what the problems are. Well, first of all, um, people think, or that would be kind of nice if it really were possible like this, is if you have some kind of a sample with bacteria and you put that water sample under the microscope and uh, then you see bacteria whizzing around under the microscope and then by looking at them, um, it would be kind of nice to say, ah, that's this type of bacterium, that's a species, yeah? simply based on the shape. And this doesn't work. And uh, uh, the reason is, uh, is, is that simply because uh, when two bacteria look the same, it does not necessarily mean that they're also related and that they're the same. And sometimes bacteria that look very different, um, they can actually uh, be quite similar in other respects. Yeah? So you know, we see that uh, um, essentially microscopes only um, allow you, quote, in quotation marks only, um, give you a very limited um, cross-section of uh, what uh, bacteria are able to do, actually, um, yeah, and how they look like. There are so many other characteristics that play a much more important role um, in determining uh, whether bacteria or certain bacteria are related or not. Um, so that was basically the short answer, but uh, actually there are many more points here, you know, five or six points here that I'd like to talk about now. Well, and in the field of uh, protozoology, I mean, these are protists, these are eukaryotes, the situation is again quite different uh, because here microscopes uh, can indeed uh, play an important role in the identification because protists, they are not only much larger, but there is simply more information there that you can uh, process uh, when you look under the microscope. Um, if you see uh, protists that uh, have cilia all over them, then these are ciliates. If it has one long flagellum, it's a flagellate. Uh, you can narrow it down much better using a microscope. Um, so I'm going to start off and one of the fundamental problems really has nothing to do with microscopy at all. One problem why microscopes cannot be used is because many bacteria that you isolate in uh, from nature have not been characterized yet. The biodiversity is extremely large um, and uh, there are estimates uh, concerning the number of bacteria, but uh, really they are very, very high. And one of the problems is, is that uh, most bacteria cannot even be grown in a laboratory, but we know that they are there because scientists have done direct DNA studies um, and uh, they simply isolated the DNA out of um, a water sample or a soil sample. And uh, then they were discovered that the biodiversity is essentially much, much higher and the most bacteria can, could not be grown in the laboratory for further analysis. Um, so essentially we end up seeing bacteria under the microscope um, that have not yet been put into the database, uh, have not been yet classified in other words. So how am I supposed to be able to identify them? Yeah? If, uh, it's not even specific to bacteria. If you see a plant somewhere that has not been described yet by a botanist by, or by anyone, um, and you are the first person to, to find the plant, you discover the plant, well, then you can also not say what plant it is because you don't know yet because it's a new plant, right? Um, so that is essentially the uh, one, one of the big problems. Uh, and uh, yeah, but there is a, yeah, we have to use uh, there for other ways, okay? And um, the other thing is, is the following, um, is this, uh, that classification that we do nowadays um, the group that's basically the grouping of, of organisms is, uh, is a, we use a so-called a natural classification system in biology. And this basically means that we group uh, living things, organisms, uh, together based um, on their evol evolutionary relationship. 
um, not on whether they actually look similar or different, but on how evolutionarily related they are. I want to give you a, a, an example for chosen polar bears and, and grizzly bears um, as an example here. Uh, both of them are bears, uh, but actually they have a different fur color. And uh, we still say that they both are bears, even though they have a different fur color because they're evolutionarily related. We do not group a black or dark brown uh, grizzly bear with a black or a brown dog. We don't put them together, obviously. I mean, they're both mammals, so they are in the same group on a much higher level. Um, but uh, we don't, yeah, we uh, put the white polar bear and the black grizzly bear together into one group, into the group of bears. Um, they're different species, okay, uh, but still uh, because they're evolutionarily related. Um, so uh, we try and tend to do this also with uh, other organisms like bacteria. And this evolutionary relatedness uh, does not always reflect in the way that they look like. So it could be that bacteria that look different, that have a different shape, essentially are more related than bacteria that have the same shape. I mean, we have also, uh, there are uh, online in the internet, for example, um, websites where you can try to find people that look exactly like you. Yeah, um, even though you're not related and you're genetically different and uh, your family histories have been separate maybe for hundreds of years, just by pure chance, you look similar uh, to another person. Yeah? But this does not mean that you're related. Okay? Um, so this is a, another thing, is, is uh, the, basically the way that we're classifying organisms. And then for this reason, um, we cannot always uh, say that simply because organisms look the same, that they're the same type of, of, of bacterium. Now, there are some, uh, some exceptions, uh, some highly specific exceptions um, that I, I give you one right now. If you see a, a, a rod-shaped bacterium under the microscope, rod-shaped, let's see the long ones, and you also see that they form endospores. These are white, uh, very bright, yeah, basically structures that the bacteria form to survive heat and dryness. Well, not so many bacteria do that, but if you find this combination, you can say maybe probably it goes into the direction of the genus Bacillus. But there are again different species in that genus, right? But you kind of maybe sometimes in some cases you can limit this a little bit um, based not only on how they look like the bacteria, but also what what uh, other structures they form um, and maybe also where you've isolated them from, and you can kind of can already narrow it down, but it doesn't. it's not generally not enough to do a really detailed identification. So yeah, sometimes it really depends on how, how detailed you want to go. Sometimes uh, um, yeah, you, you can say, okay, I'm just happy if I'm, I'm stuck at the genus level, you know. Um, of course, if you look under the microscope um, and you see, uh, or when I look under the microscope, I, I can, and I see certain things moving around, and I say, ah, these are bacteria. And I'm quite sure that these are bacteria based on simply the way, um, you know, their size and their characteristic shape. Yeah? But I mean, of course, maybe, hmm, maybe I've also misidentified and said some of them maybe are bacteria, even though they are in reality, reality very small ciliates or flagellates. And I, think I kind of con may have mistaken them as, as bacteria because they have a similar size. But again, you see here, it depends a lot on, on, on what level you're satisfied with. You would just say, okay, these are bacteria. And uh, yeah, then of course it's, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so in other words, it uh, was already an additional point. It depends quite a lot on, on, on at what level you want to um, identify your, your organisms here. Yeah, and, uh, and another thing is, is uh, there are um, always, uh, is always a reclassification going on as well. <laughs> so this means that, uh, um, especially in the field of bacteriology and systematic bacteriology, um, yeah, there are new discoveries going on and... Uh, People have uh, used uh, in the past maybe microscopes uh, and also maybe a chemical uh, composition of bacteria or metab uh, metabolic uh, products that they formed. I'm going to talk about this um, to classify and to, uh, to bacteria and to group them together. And then newer studies actually show us that they have been misclassified. That two uh, types of species of bacteria have been put together into the same group, but in reality they are yeah belong to different uh, genera. Yeah, and actually they're quite much, uh, quite separate. Okay, so there is uh, quite a bit of reclassification going on, um, uh, so where the evolutionary tree uh, in bacteria has to be kind of redrawn. Uh, quite as a matter of fact, quite a lot is going on here. Um, so this is also always dynamically changing to a certain extent, and uh, this also makes, of course, uh, identification very difficult. So I mean, I basically not uh, said quite a bit of of, of why um, microscopes only have a limited value in in, in 
in, in bacterial identification. Um, so where can microscopes now be used? Well, for example, um, microscopes are used in the field of bacteriology for quality control. So for example, when I have a growth medium, liquid growth medium, and I uh, put, I don't know, E. coli into that growth medium because I'm going to do experiments with E. coli, and I, and I know that E. coli are rod-shaped bacteria, long uh, bacteria, elongated ones, and all of a sudden I see cocci, which are round bacteria, in my in my sample, and I know, gee, this is not a pure sample anymore. I've got a contaminant in there, right? And I can do that quite uh, quickly with uh, um, by putting a small drop of this growth medium under the microscope to do a quality control check. And uh, I don't know which uh, type of uh, contaminants they are, these round bacteria. I don't know if, uh, what they are. I have not identified them, but it's also not necessary because I know that they're not supposed to be in there. It's not a pure medium anymore. There are these funny stories, really. Actually, these are not really funny. Uh, it is uh, actually quite horrible. <laughs> Very... Uh, um, it was a story. It was a warning when I was still at university. This uh, student was given um, yeah bacteria to work with to do a genetic analysis, not a genetic, to do some some DNA uh, studies and uh, was E. coli that was given for for doing some some genetics uh, and um, after the, the, the basically the course uh, the, the student never produced any results. It didn't work. All of the experiments failed until until they discovered at the very end uh, that the student was not working with E. coli anymore, but with some kind of a yeast. How in the world does this work? Well, the student accidentally continued to work uh, and to continue to um, grow a yeast contaminant. Yeah. So this is a yeah, and a, some, uh, just a one minute look under the microscope would have uh, already shown that um, you're working with a contaminant, and the student simply kept on working, working, working. It was never E. coli, that, uh, but uh, it was a yeast, and it didn't work. Um, so lots of many weeks of work uh, lost. This was kind of the story told us uh, as a warning how important it is to while you work to do a quality control check uh, yeah, using a microscope so that you actually still know that you're working with that, uh, those bacteria uh, that you expect to work because identifying a contaminant is, is quite easily done using a microscope. Okay, um, So this kind of uh, shows uh, why microscopes in the field of bacteriology and microbiology are um, still important. It was actually like, like this, I have to tell you a little bit more, it's that uh, in the field of genetics they're working with so-called um, antibiotic uh, plates, uh, so there are these petri dishes that contain antibiotics which should actually kill off everything else um, except the bacterium, that uh, the E. coli bacterium that you want to work with. Um, so this kind of, uh, you try to prevent contamination by you putting those uh, antibiotics in them and then only your bacteria will actually grow. But in this case, um, the antibiotic which kills off bacteria um, of course, does not kill off yeasts, which are which are not bacteria; they're eukaryotes, um, and this could be the reason. Yeah, so I just want to, yeah, for those of you a little bit more interested in in the, in the details of, of what actually went wrong here, this was kind of a warning. Don't always trust your antibiotics in your petri dish, but also do a quality control check using a microscope. This is basically what they told us. Okay, so well, I want to now move on a little bit. Is how do you now identify bacteria? How do you know, do that now? Okay. Um, especially bacteria that have basically not yet been classified and have not been um, I, yeah, put into the database. And there are essentially, there are, there are several more methods, but there are three of them that I would like to talk about. And of course, uh, the, the big important one is a DNA study. It's uh, fairly simple. This is you, and uh, you basically um, isolate the DNA out of a bacterium um, and uh, you sequence a part of the DNA. There's a certain standardized region that you sequence. There are machines that do that, and then, yeah, it works like this in, in, in real life. Um, just to tell it to you, it's actually quite a simple preparation technique. You take your bacterial uh, suspension, your, your medium with the bacteria in it. It's usually um, yeah, a salt water, a saline solution, and, and uh, you suspend your bacteria in there, uh, which you isolate from your Petri dish. And then you have it in a little plastic tube, and then what you do is, is you throw the whole plastic tube with a liquid containing the bacterium into liquid nitrogen. It shock freezes them, and what happens is uh, when you shock freeze them is, is that the, the water inside the bacterium expands because uh, frozen water uh, takes up a greater volume. So basically by freezing them, you break open the cells because the water inside the cell freezes, and, and cells freeze and uh, it expands and this pops open the cell and releases all of the cell's contents. 
and uh, this uh, yeah also the DNA and then you basically hand this over uh, to the sequencing department in your lab and then you'll get an email and a bill <laughs> and then you'll get an email and uh, with uh, the DNA sequence and then you will type this into the database and then you can um, search the database which bacteria have a very similar sequence and this basically means that even if uh, exactly the same sequence is not in the database um, it's you can have a similarity okay and uh, then this is a pretty cool uh, way. I, I like this a lot uh, because it's fairly easy and, and, and fairly fast. Um, and it allows you to uh, yeah, narrow down and also identify bacteria that uh, yeah, basically um, are not yet in the database. And then, of course, you kind of hope that it's not in the database yet because then you've made a new discovery. Yeah? So that's uh, basically the first one. The second uh, possibility is... Uh, it was actually also quite used a lot before they had uh, sequencing machines, is, is you analyze uh, the metabolic products uh, that the bacteria are able to use. Um, no, this was a nonsense what I just said, not the metabolic products that they're able to use, but that they're able to form, of course. Um, you form in metabolic products. So this is used uh, or has been used, maybe still is used in, if uh, you're interested in a certain number of limited uh, bacteria that are, for example, for example, medically relevant. Okay, And you already, you already have narrowed it down already. And then simply by, by looking at it, is it able to use certain types of sugars or is it able to break down gelatin, as a, as a, which is a protein? Um, is it able to form acid? Um, if you give it uh, certain types of sugar and then you have this kind of a pH indicator substance and then you kind of do a whole test uh, using these um, metabolic products and these are also, yeah, they have already prepared uh, some of those test kits that allow you to test, I don't know, 10 or 15 different parameters and uh, based on the color change, usually because there's some kind of a pH indicator in there, you can already then uh, check it with a database and uh, then you can identify the bacteria, okay? Um, yeah, so this, however, of course, only works again if uh, your medically relevant bacteria are in the database. And then uh, the last one that I want to talk about is called uh, chemotaxonomy. It's uh, by uh, analyzing what the bacteria are actually made of. Um, so you grow the bacteria in pure culture and uh, then you uh, analyze what they're made of, essentially. Um, so, for example, the, the membrane, uh, the cell membrane of the bacteria is made of uh, certain fatty acids. And you can now use a gas chromatograph, which is a device, to analyze which fatty acids are present, um, and so on. So there are a whole uh, range of different uh, chemicals that you can test for. And, of course, um, you want to check those uh, substances uh, that are actually also very characteristic and that actually allow you to differentiate the different bacteria. I mean, ultimately, when you want to I'll give you again a, a stupid example from, from, which is probably more familiar to you, if you want to uh, distinguish different uh, brands of cars, for example, um, you're not going to check the number of wheels that they have because they all have four wheels, right? So the number of wheels cannot be really used. Also, the color is not used. You cannot just say because the blue car, it's a BMW, and all red cars are Fords, and no, that doesn't work like that. Of course not. So you see that uh, in one case, the number of wheels is a, uh, is a characteristic that is very conserved. It's too conserved, yeah, because all cars have that. And, and, uh, um, and the color is, is not conserved at all um, because um, it's so different that uh, even within one brand of a car, one make of a car, you have all different colors. So these are two extremes that are not useful for um, as characteristics. And uh, you have the same thing in bacterial identification. You have to um, find uh, you have to find uh, characteristics that are not too conserved, that not all of them share. Um, and you have to also find characteristics that are so different that even very similar or related bacteria um, are different. Yeah. Um, so you need something in between, really. Um, and uh, this is uh, this kind of this principle applies to pretty much all of the things that I'm all of the methods that I'm using here. Is is, is that uh, when you look at the DNA piece um, for bacteria, it's not allowed to be the same for different bacteria, and it's not allowed to be too different. Yeah. And uh, when you are using microscopes, so then uh, the shape is really not a characteristic that's sufficiently conserved. I mean, even because even related bacteria um, can have a different shape. Yeah? So this is a little bit the reason why um, I've been deep diving now really into the depths right now. This is one of the reasons why microscopes only have, uh, in the identification process itself, um, 
um, yeah, don't play such a big role, but they play a role in characterizing it. So if you discover new bacterial species using, I don't know, DNA studies, um, you're, and you want to describe that, then what you still have to do is you still have to use a microscope and you have to say, aha, it's a rod-shaped bacterium, okay, an elongated one, or it's a coccus, uh, your cocci, which are round ones, okay, or they're spiral-shaped, spirilla, spirochetes, yeah? or curved bacteria, they have a vibrio, vibrio shape, okay. So the, what I'm saying here is, is that um, the microscopes still are uh, necessary and required for characterization, um, once uh, you have uh, used other methods that already help you to either describe it or to, to, yeah, to identify it. Okay, so this kind of uh, yeah, gives you a quick run through um, through a bacterial identification and I kind of talked a little bit about not only what the problems are um, related to microscopes but also um, yeah, how actually a bacteria are identified. And yeah, I think uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just gonna say bye bye right now. Wish you all the best and, and see you around next time. Bye bye.